everyone. Welcome back to Old Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today I'm excited to be kicking off a rolling solo showcase here on the channel for Frostpunk, the board game from Glass Cannon Unplugged. Now, you remember about two years ago, we did a full Kickstarter preview for Frostpunk, the board game. At that time, I was doing it on Tabletop Simulator, and I was doing it with the designer of the game himself. Inside of this showcase, I'm going to be playing this in its final form in front of you in this showcase, but this video is going to focus focus on showing you how to set the game up in the least amount of time possible. We're going to rip through this setup as quickly as possible, but also give you a visual to show you exactly how to get this game to the table so you can enjoy it in a solo capacity. Without further ado, let's get started with the setup. Inside the scenario book for the game, you're going to find a number of different setups that you can begin with in order to try to survive your way through a game of Frostpunk the board game. But for your very first game, it's recommended to play the way that it's instructed in the rulebook to set up the game, and that's for a New Hope Crater scenario, which we'll be setting up right now. We'll begin by placing the generator tile in the middle of the play area. Next, we're going to create the rim board, which is comprised of six different pieces. You can see two of them attached here, simply like a puzzle piece. Here's a look at the completed rim around the generator tile. Place the generator on the generator tile, and this includes the drawer at the bottom, but keep the generator upgrade component in the box until you're required to use it. And we've now placed five wood and five coal. Next step is to find the starting wall tiles, although I would call these tokens as they're quite small. Make sure they're all face down as some of them are blank. Shuffle them all up so you have no idea which one's which. Some of them will have coal on them, some of them will have wood, and others will be blank. You're going to choose a corner of the rim board, whichever corner you wish to start with. Grab one of the tokens, reveal it on that corner, and continue revealing tokens around each corner of the rim board. I chose to start in the top left-hand corner. The first one revealed is a coal deposit. Continuing clockwise around the rim board, we have a wood deposit. The next one pulled is a blank, a second blank in a row, a second coal deposit in the south, and another blank over here in the southwest. We have a total of three tiles, or as I like to put it, tokens, depicting deposits of coal or wood. So at this point, the ones we did not pull, and any ones that were blank go back to the box. Now you're going to want to separate the map tiles into two stacks based on their backs. Shuffle each of the stacks separately and place them face down nearby. This is the near tile stack and this is the far tile stack. And at this point we're going to deal with the far tile stack first. We're going to place one in each corner that does not have a wood or coal deposit. With those now in place, we're going to grab three near tiles and place them in between each of the far tiles and the generator tile. Now let's flip over all the near and far tiles we've just placed into play. Once all the tiles are flipped upwards, make sure that they're facing towards you so you can easily see the icons on them. And now we're going to go ahead and place all the resources depicted. The tiles are split into two major parts. You have the top and the bottom. In some cases, you'll get just one or the other. In other cases, you'll get both. Here we have three coal and three wood. Now you'll also notice on some tiles it'll depict a food icon. If it does this, don't worry about it. We'll be dealing with this when we get to the population board later in the setup. These tiles revealed steam cores on the top section of the hexes, so one in each space as depicted by the icon. And down below there on one of the hexes we have two trees. We also have some food to keep in mind for later. And in the northeast corner we have two wood, another hex with two wood and a coal. The setup refers to a bank of resources like wood, coal, steam cores, trees, citizen meeples, and a number of other tokens and tiles. You can choose whether you keep these within your play area or inside the game box, whichever is easiest for you. For the purposes of this video, I decided to keep them off the play area. Now the next thing we're going to move into is the setup for the expedition display. You're going to find the expedition cards A, B, and C, and you may be removing certain cards based on the scenario you're playing, but if you're playing the new home crater scenario, you're going to keep all the cards in there. You're going to shuffle up these three decks and place them white side up. Next, you're going to take the top three cards off of the A deck and place them face up along the right edge of the map. Each of these cards is the start of an expedition stack, and expedition cards may be added to each stack later on. Now we move to the technology display, where we're going to go ahead and grab the technology cards and remove any of the cards not used in our scenario. For the new home crater scenario, we don't use the steam hub cards, so that's going to be removed. We now shuffle the remaining technology cards, select four at random, placing them face up along the bottom right edge of the map. This is going to form the technology display. We have natural fertilizer, charcoal clean upgrade, night care, lighter scout sleds, and all the rest of the technology cards go back to the box. 
Finally, take each of the four development tokens and place them on their inactive side on each of the technology cards, making sure that it is the gray and black side of the token and not the white and gray side of the token. Next, we're going to choose a society card, which is going to have a big time impact on our gameplay. In this particular case, playing the very first game, the recommended one to use is society number one, normal. Depending on which society you choose, there are varying difficulty levels. The one we have here being normal states, along the way, we've lost people and found new companions. We're a motley crew, but the hardships of the journey gave us a sense of unity. There is hope for us. We even managed to preserve enough food to be able to feed our children, at least for now. We now move to the setup of the population board where we're going to place citizen and sickness markers on the corresponding spaces of the population track, the upper track on the population board, as per the society card we've chosen. As you can see on the society card that we have, we have a total of 22 workers, which is actually a token placed off screen here to the far right, which I'll show you momentarily. We have 12 engineers, which I've placed right here with the blue marker. And then we have eight children, which we've placed down here. Also, all three of those different types of individuals None of them are sick. You can now see the marker depicting the workers far down the population track. Now we're gonna go ahead and place the food marker on the corresponding space of the food track, the lower track of the population board, based on the amount of food we start with, and that's also on the society card. Based on our society card, in the bottom left-hand corner, it shows a knife and a fork with an eight beside it, so we have eight food marked with a yellow marker on the eighth position of the food track. And also, we now get to take a look at all those revealed map tiles during seven up that had the food icon on them and increased the food marker because of each of them. Across all of them, we had a pretty good haul. We got two here, two here, and five way up in the top right. So that's going to take us from eight up to 17. The final thing to do here is to place the hunger token, which is a red token, on the zero space of the track. We're now moving on to supply board setup, and we're placing this right underneath the expedition display based on your society card. It's going to tell you exactly where to place the corpse marker, which you can see below. In this case, for society one normal, it's going on marker space one. Next, you're going to place the starting number of wood, coal, and steam cords from the bank onto the supply board as shown from your society card. In this case, we have four wood and five coal. We have no steam cores. Next, for each type of citizen, you're going to place a number of citizen meeples based on the position of the corresponding citizen marker on the population track. You simply take a look at the different type of citizen markers on your population track and look above as to which area they are inside of. It'll tell you exactly how many meeples for each of them. Now, if your society card depicts any automatons, you'll go ahead and place them. I have zero. Lastly, place the spent citizen tokens beside the supply board. The supply board represents what you currently have available to you, and it's worth mentioning that not every player, if playing with multiple players, have their own individual supply areas. There's just one for the the whole city. We're moving on to the buildings board setup, which is going to be placed right underneath of the supply. First, you need to sort all the buildings by type and then place the types depicted on the building board on their corresponding spaces, which are shown here watermarked, and you'll also see them filled in right now. In the first row, we have the workshop, the charcoal clin, the hunter's hut, and the gathering post. The next row has the factory, and remember, we do have a factory which was already on the generator tile from the beginning, a sawmill, and a medical post. Next up, we have the beacon and the coal thumper, the infirmary and the hothouse, the coal mine and the wall drill, and lastly, from top to bottom, the house, bunkhouse, and tent. You want to ensure that the tiles are placed on their non-upgraded side face up. The way you know that you're on your upgraded side is when you see diamonds surrounding the name itself. You'll notice a number of these have diamonds surrounding the name themselves on the tile, but there's exceptions. The workshop and factory buildings are the same on both sides, and the shelters, house, bunkhouse, and tent have ruins on the opposite side, so you keep them on the side with the diamonds. Now you'll have buildings beyond what has been placed here, and of course, duplicates of each of these buildings have been placed underneath as well. The ones that are not used on this building board, other types of buildings, will be dealt with later on. The hope and discontent board is the next thing to set up. We're gonna place all the discontent tokens into the bag with the icon of the closed fist for discontent and we're going to draw a number of tokens from the bag indicated by the society card placing them on the leftmost space of the discontent track the number before the slash indicates how many tokens to draw so in this case two and the number after the slash indicates how many of these tokens to place active side up two in this case starting with the leftmost 
And we're gonna do exactly the same for the hope bag as well. We place all the tokens inside, shuffle them up so we have no idea which one we're grabbing, and grabbing two out of the bag, but two of them will be active side up. After pulling tokens from the bag, we got two that relate to apathy. One is active, the other is inactive. The two hope markers, starting with the left and heading to the right, is justice, which is on its active side in white. And then beside it, we have care, which is also active in white. Now we're gonna set up the round and mourning board. The first thing we do is place the round marker on space one of the round track. Next, shuffle the morning cards, place them face down on the indicated space of the board. The morning deck has now been assembled and we're gonna now place the storm marker on the appropriate space based on the scenario book. And for a new home crater scenario we're playing, the storm marker goes on space nine. That's gonna do it. We're now gonna move to the future law display. From the law cards you have, which you can easily find by the front side of them showing law at the very top, you also look at the bottom for identification codes. You're gonna to wanna to separate the cards which are marked L01 through to L08 and place them face up in a pile in a future law display. Shuffle the remaining law cards marked L09 to L16 together and choose four at random, placing them with the other eight law cards you've already placed in the future law display. Then return any unused law cards to the box. They're not needed in the game. The deck on the left is the future law display. It has cards, as I mentioned, L01 through L08. I've also added four random cards to this as well. That completes that deck on the left. On the right hand side, we have the Law Consequence deck. You'll be able to find these cards, as you can see them right now, they're face up. They have a purple back on their face. I'm gonna flip them over, give them a shuffle, and that's gonna create the Law Consequence cards. The final step for the future law display involves tying in the buildings boards. We're gonna to go to that. We're gonna add some additional buildings, which by default always appear, and also any additional buildings which come from any cards in the future law display deck. Here are the law specific buildings by default, which go below the buildings board. We have the child shelter. We have four faith and order buildings. They are the field kitchen, the cemetery, the temple, and the faith keepers. And of course, we now gonna look at the four random laws that we added into the law display to see if we need to add any additional buildings to this pool. To give you a visual, I've gone ahead and opened up the future law display again. I have cards one through eight right here. Here are the four random ones that got added in. If you take a look through these cards, you'll see at times it'll mention to unlock the care house building. So this will let us know we need the care house building as part of the other buildings next to the buildings board. And just like that, we brought in the care house into the display based on our law cards. We're now moving on to the dusk board. We're gonna place the inevitable dusk card, which is D000, face down on the middle space. Next, we're gonna shuffle the social dispute cards. Easy to find those, just find the face of cards which have social dispute on them. Shuffle them together, they should have a greenish face to them, shuffle them and place them in the rightmost spot. Next, we're supposed to read through the top social dispute card so we know what to expect and then flip it face down and shuffle it with the inevitable card to create the dusk deck. Here's a look at both of the cards up close. You can read them over before we shuffle them together and place them face down in the middle. The rest of the dusk cards, which you'll see as it'll state dusk at the very top of a large deck of red faced cards, you can place these off to the side or back in the game box until you're required to use them. We're now moving to the generator board. We're gonna place it on the left-hand side of the play area. We're gonna place the heat marker on its normal side on the first space of the heat track. Next, find the three heat range indicators. You'll see them on the right-hand side of the board here. And we're gonna place them starting with red, then orange, then yellow up the track. Now we're gonna place the cold marker on the fifth space of the heat track. At this point, you're gonna find the weather card deck and you're gonna remove any weather cards that don't relate to the scenario you're playing. If you're playing the very first one, a new home crater, then all the weather cards will be included. Shuffle this deck, place it in the topmost space. With the weather deck now done, we're finished with the generator board. We're gonna to move to advisors and citizens. Each player is gonna choose an advisor card. If you're playing solo, you'll just be selecting one advisor. Flipping the advisors over, there's alternative art on the opposite side, but the abilities stay the same. I'm gonna choose the health advisor. Now it's important to note when you're playing solo, you need to make sure you grab the call to rise card in addition of your chosen advisor. All the advisors which weren't chosen go back to the game box. They will not be used in this game. We now grab the citizen deck and again, 
again, based on the scenario we're playing, certain cards might be removed. For this new home crater scenario, all citizen cards are used. We're gonna shuffle this deck up, and based on us playing a solo game, we're gonna draw seven citizen cards into our hand. At this point, each player, or in my case myself, has to choose and discard one of the citizen cards, placing it face up in the discard pile, which is gonna be placed next to the citizen deck. I'm gonna have it to the left of our large area map, and a player has to pay the starting cost of the card, which is shown in the upper right corner, to discard a card in this way. I'm gonna discard this citizen right here, and it stays to remove one wood from the map. I'm gonna choose to take it from the northeast hex. A card cannot be discarded if its starting cost cannot be paid. The player must choose another card instead. So because I could do this, I was able to discard that card. If you're unable to discard any card because you can't pay the starting cost, then you discard one citizen card from your hand. You ignore the cost, but you add one six citizen of the discarded citizen card type instead. Quite easy, take a look at the citizen. You'll see the green is children, orange is workers, and blue engineer. It'll let you know exactly which one to add an additional six citizen to in terms of its type if you can't pay the starting cost when discarding it. We're now in the home stretch of setup. The next thing to find is the phase tracker card. This is a nice breakdown or reference as to the different phases in the game. You're also going to want to take the phase marker token and place it on the action phase. Now we're going to find the scenario cards for the chosen scenario. We are playing the new home crater scenario. So we're placing scenario card 1 slash 01 face up in a scenario display area. And the rest can be face down nearby. In my case, for easier viewing, I'm going to keep the scenario cards closer to the camera so you can read them in full. And that's exactly what we need to do as the next step of this. We're going to read this scenario card carefully. The card states, are we alone? Civilization has fallen. We, the survivors, traveled in a convoy that split into several groups to increase the chances of reaching a functional generator. Our group succeeded. What fate has befallen the others? Lighting up a signal to guide the lost souls will help to answer that question. Now, the thing you're looking at here on this scenario card is in green, round four and round 11. Both of these will let us know exactly where to place scenario markers. Now, find the green scenario scenario trigger tokens, which you can see to the left of the round and morning board. We're going to place them in the two rounds that were denoted on the scenario card, which is four and ten. This, of course, will serve as a reminder as we move through the rounds. Now place the storm card for your chosen scenario face down. I've placed it next to the generator board. And if you're playing the new home crater scenario, you're using scenario card 1 slash 08. And remember, that should be inside of the scenario display deck, which is face down. Just pull that card out, place it over here face down. You're good to go. Now place the stockpile markers near the scenario display. You'll see three of them in green. There is a leadership marker token, which you give to a player at random. However, when you're playing solo, you don't need this leadership token. The final step of setup is to give each player the responsibility sheet, which corresponds to the advisor card they took earlier. For me, I took the health advisor, but I am playing solo, so I'm going to take all four of these sheets as reference. Good to have them nearby. It's also worth mentioning any components not required for the chosen scenario can be returned back to the box. I highly recommend, as a solo player, reading over these responsibility sheets as it breaks the game into the four major areas that you'll have to manage and maintain. Foreman, Health, Social, and Generator. Again, if you're playing with multiple people around the table, each one could take one of these or more in order to have an understanding of how that aspect of the game works so they can control and fully understand that aspect. And that, my friends, is going to wrap up the solo setup for Frostpunk the board game from Glass Cannon Unplugged. Really hope this helps you get the game to the table easier. It also helps you get past the setup of this one. And in the next video, we're going to dive into the gameplay and show you how this thing flows and operates. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo.